the National Veterans Memorial and Museum began with a vision from the late Senator John Glenn, who understood the value of telling and sharing the story of our veterans. From the initial view, the architecture impresses upon visitors the importance of what lies within. Seeming to rise organically from the earth, the building itself is a symbol of our nation's veterans and their resilient spirit and unending commitment to making this country stronger. Once inside the museum, visitors embark on a narrative journey, following exhibitions that focus on the servicemen and women and their families. Individual stories and shared experiences are illustrated through personal artifacts, quotes, letters, photographs, and powerful films of veterans telling their unique story in their own words. The National Veterans Memorial and Museum. It's more than a museum. It's the new home of the brave. Plan your visit Plan today. Your visit today. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our latest virtual rally point here at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. My name is Colonel Retired Bill Butler, Chief of Staff, and on behalf of our President and CEO, Lieutenant General Retired Mike Verder, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for uh, joining us. We've got a great conversation about an exciting, soon to premiere public broadcast service documentary about the veteran experience. This morning, we'll be talking with a producer and a featured veteran about their involvement in American Veteran, produced by GBH and PBS. And just as a reminder for folks who may not be familiar with GBH, uh, it's a, a, a broadcast company out of Boston. Uh, GBH enriches people's lives through programs and services that educate, inspire, and entertain, fostering citizenship and culture, the joy of learning, and the power of diverse perspectives. And we're going to see that today in their great work, uh, The American Veteran. So according to Pew Research Center and the Department of Veterans Affairs, there are 19 million U.S. veterans representing less than 10 percent of the total U.S. adult population. Gulf War era veterans are now the largest group of veterans in the United States, having surpassed uh, the population of Vietnam era veterans just <coughs> four years ago in 2016. And the share of U.S. population with military experience is declining and VA projections show that the demographic of living veterans will continue to, to decline for the next 25 years. Fewer and fewer members of Congress have military experience. And moreover, the demographics of veterans has and will continue to change, becoming more racially and ethnically diverse, younger, and with a higher percentage of women serving in the military. All good things, more representative of our society. So joining us today are Amanda Pollock, GBH and a producer of American Veteran. Joining her is Cody Aon, a veteran of the Navy, Navy and the Army who is featured in America Veteran. Our moderator is our president and CEO, who is a combat veteran of Mogadishu, Somalia, also with three deployments to Iraq as a general officer and 35 year distinguished, 35 uh, year Army veteran, um, Lieutenant General Mike Verder. So, sir, over to you. Thanks, Bill, and welcome everybody to Rally Point for October 2021. And Rally Point began as our opportunity to welcome veterans into the National Veterans Memorial Museum. And uh, we really started with brunch, uh, allowing fellowship and comradeship and really making sure that that no one was sleeping in a car and, and if they needed any help. And then we grew it to bring veteran service organizations in. And, uh, and provide services and help our veterans find employment as well. And most of that, of course, was done here locally in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and then we brought in uh, notable speakers and, and, in fact, two years ago celebrated October 3rd 
uh, and remembered our fallen rangers from Mogadishu. Tomorrow is uh, the Battle of Black Sea that Bill will mention later. Um, and then COVID hit, and so we we uh, refused to to close. We just shifted to virtual events. All told, probably about 50 now, and we've reached uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And we still uh, fulfill our mission to connect veterans to America and America to veterans. And so today's show is fantastic, and I'm truly excited about it. Uh, so we mentioned the soon to be broadcast docu documentary, American Veteran, but we haven't seen anything yet. So let's cut to the first clip, which is a short trailer to learn more about it. Take it, Jinx. I flew with B-17 bombers. I volunteered for missions because I couldn't stop. It was just too exciting. I was an aerial door gunner. As a woman, I had to prove myself day in and day out. We cried, we laughed, we killed. We did everything together and for one another. You think you're uncomfortable hearing my story? Imagine how uncomfortable it was living it. But I'll put on that uniform. I represented the United States of America. And you know what? That's still who I am inside. Being a veteran is like speaking a different language. And when you're around these people who have served, you feel understood. We are living history. I am primary source. I'm telling you my story. fantastic so amanda and cody let's uh let's hear a little bit of who you are tell us about yourselves and where you grew up and cody let's not get into your service just yet and so amanda would you please lead the way sure um uh, first of all thank you so much for having us um uh i want to also just say that you know in order to make this film it was it was due to the support of our funders the Wexner Family Charitable Fund, Battelle, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Analog Devices, and J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, couldn't have done it without them. So um, this has been an amazing project for us. I, I am from New York City. Uh, I am not personally a veteran. Um, and this project came about, uh, I've, I've been making historical films for my whole career. and. We had just finished a three-part uh, film about World War I called The Great War with GBH. And I was really struck in that project by uh, just the degree to which uh, military service sh uh, shaped this nation at that moment. It really <laughs> divine, defined our national identity. Um, and it made me more curious about understanding kind of the the influence of service on people and the way in which um, veterans continue to shape our nation. Um, and now today without a draft, I think it's more important than ever to have, have these conversations. So that's sort of how this all started for me. Did you, just so we put uh, some timing points on it, did you have this program started before you learned of the National Veterans Memorial Museum or uh, is there a connection? There was definitely a connection. It was it was kind of simultaneous. Uh, we were GBH was in conversation with the museum as as the idea was coming about, and um, and so we were absolutely influenced by by the project of the museum. I think you were just finishing construction as this project was getting off the ground. So it was very exciting actually to visit the museum for the first time um, as we were right in the 
depth of all of our research and right. see the wonderful exhibits there. Fantastic. Um, so Cody, tell us about yourself and, and uh, take us through your youth and the influencers in your life. And uh, we'll, we'll circle back a little bit later about your service to our nation. Yes, sir. Well, good. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for the opportunity and uh, uh, this this blessed day to be a part of all of this. I'm so excited for this special be coming out, and, and um, my family is excited about it all. I'm from a small community uh, along the uh, U.S. Uh, Mexico border, a little town called Demi, New Mexico, and uh, it's a small farming ranching community. And born and raised there, graduated from there, joined the service from there and uh, went out and saw the great big world. And I'm just thrilled and excited to be a part of all of this. I've lived all over the country, been all over the world. And if my experience in this uh, endeavor can help help anyone out uh, in any way, shape or form, I'm, I'm just honored and thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I asked each of you uh, the other day, uh, who was the first veteran that you met? And uh, Cody, tell who was an influencer in your youth with regard to your decisions to join and serve our, our country in the military? Well, uh, just about every male in my family uh, back to World War I has served in the, in the military in one shape or form. Uh, my father's a veteran, a Navy veteran as well. And uh, I just, I had so many influences from him and uh, veterans I was growing up around, uh, especially through my tribal lineage uh, I'm Tashishta, I'm Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne from Oklahoma on my father's side. And I grew up around uh, powwows, board dances, different events that uh, signify and honor uh, veterans. And I grew up listening to their stories, seeing who they were, hearing about their experiences. And it really influenced me on such a magnitude that I wanted to go out and be a part of all of that. So I've had so many... Uh, impacts from from those individuals from uncles uh to my father to my grandfathers those folks that have really made an impact on my life and pushed me in the in the military uh direction so i was just from the get-go when i was a kid i was in awe of hearing their stories hearing hearing my uncle talk about uh being a tunnel rat in vietnam i i, I couldn't imagine someone doing that i still can't imagine somebody doing that and i've been to combat it, it was amazing just to hear their stories and, and they, they pushed me, uh, you know, in, 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 any, in any category you could think of to be the better, a better le leader person, uh, part of my community, whatever it was, that, that military aspect has always been there. And I'm so glad and honored that I, I had that, uh, that push and drive as I was a young man. Yeah, so are we. And Amanda, you're not a veteran, but tell us how you decided to get involved in, in this project and your motivation to tell the American veteran story. Well, I think um, I'm not I'm not a veteran, but um, I realize, and I've certainly, I don't think I even I had no idea what I didn't know when I was getting into this project. But um, but through the course of the project, uh, we've spoken to so many incredible people. We interviewed um, 45 veterans for this project. We spoke to hundreds of them in the process of, of making the film and, and casting it and um, understanding what the experience is and, and seeing the sort of um, way in which service just completely transforms a person. I mean, what was so surprising in some ways is when you look at the reason why people serve, people come into the military for so many different reasons. Um, you know, patriotism, um, uh, looking for structure in their lives, uh, you know, wanting to see the world, so many reasons. Um, but then that you really see a common thread with everybody um, as they talk about their experience in terms of the impact of service and wanting to be part of something bigger. And that really influenced me um, just listening to these stories and realizing how much I think civilians have to learn from veterans. Um, and so I think I, I knew going into it that I wanted to start a conversation or, or be part of a conversation between civilians and veterans, um, but uh, it has been way more powerful than I ever thought it would be. Yeah, they, you know, as we 
uh, Colonel Butler, Bill Butler, and I served as Cody served. There's always kind of a an ongoing narrative in, in military circles about you know transformation, and I've always been one to say the most powerful, the biggest, the most important transformation is not a new jet or an aircraft carrier or a tank or uh, a new carbine rifle or a new night scope. It's the transformation that takes high schoolers in a very short period of time uh, through their basic training or boot camp or one station unit training. And suddenly um, they're soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Coast Guard, and now Space Forcemen. But think about it. Um, three years later, they're team leaders, they're sergeants. And the, that, and they are living the values of the, of the military and they are teaching. And then they go on for long careers or short careers and uh, become our very valuable uh, veterans. So, so uh, you know, it is amazing to me to see how that occurs. Um, so yeah, we, we actually, um, the first episode of the program is called The Crossing, and because we really, um, that, that was so much what we were hearing through the conversations that we were having is just, you know, one of our, one, one person we spoke to said, you know, from before training to after training, you're just never, you're never the same person. Um, and we just saw that again, again and again, it really um, has such an impact on people. Yeah, that's fantastic. Cody, any, any thoughts about that transition from uh, from being a, a young uh, football player in high school and, and a great athlete to suddenly you've made it through your first boot camp. Yeah, that's a that's a huge step. I thought I knew what teamwork was. I wasn't even close <laughs> being a part of a you know a high school football team that was real successful. I I had a background and family and friends that supported me and and when I got out into boot camp, I had no idea how much that influenced me it was a part of my life and when i was thrown into into boot camp and we had to lean on each other uh to make it to graduation to get you know get to where you're going no matter what service you're in as an individual it's uh it's nerve-wracking you're you're a young person 18 19 years old a few people that were in their 30s i remember and you could even see it was taking their toll on them it's just it's just a, a stressful environment and it's made to it's made to for it, you know forge who you are. You come out of the fire a little bit stronger after that, but you're still not even ready yet. You're not tempered for, for what's coming. But it's a it's a huge leap, a great transition, and I'm, I'm grateful for my experience with it. I know some people don't make it through it, but that's uh that's part of life. Not everybody's going to get through that program, but uh, it sure molded me into who I am in a fast, quick hurry. I'll tell you what, it's, it, it was a great adventure at least for the first part of my career. Yeah, and Amanda, I, you, you interviewed uh, veterans from, from you know, World War II to present. What surprised you about what they had in common? Um, despite, you know, the last tough Ranger class is the one that you go to and everyone else has an easy one. And, you know, each one thinks that they were, the, you know, the generation that really had a, a tough go and, and and the next generation is softer uh, in many ways or you know cuddled um but w the common ground that you saw what, what would you how would you describe that yeah i mean it was interesting because you know to make a, you know when when we began this project um we were really the goal was to make a film about veterans. And what does that even mean, a veteran, to to, to say that there is a single definition of a veteran um, is, is absurd. And so we were really struggling in the beginning to figure out, you know, how do we how do we define this and how do we sort of grapple with the incredible multiplicity of experience and of people? Um, and then also kind of link that to a, a kind of commonality in a culture. And I will say that, um, you know, we interviewed so many people, and as I said, so many different backgrounds and so many different experiences, but they really, there, there is this intense common culture that um, so many people spoke about in terms of how, um, how comfortable they felt 
when they were in a room with other veterans and just mm -hmm. sort of the idea of a of a common language that that veterans could speak with one another um so i think in a way that was what surprised me was just how this group you know that is that is so diverse in so many different ways actually really does have this incredible commonality and community yeah here in the in the at the National Veterans Memorial Museum, as you go through our alcoves, uh, the first several of them, the first several storytelling by the veterans um, are a nation called and then why I served and then leaving home, taking the oath of office and then basic training. And when we when we give tours uh, to visitors, we say this is the me and the I part of it. And when we get to basic training, we start the we and the brotherhood and the sisterhood and the shipmate and the wingman and the ranger buddy and the fellow Marine. And I think that's what um, you saw as well was, hey, they went through something that made them part of the of the we and, and they are touched that way for life. We have Absolutely. a we have a second. Uh, this is from the first episode. So let's go ahead and play that and then uh, we'll discuss. It's about seven minutes. So bear with us and enjoy. This just in, you are looking at the World Trade Center and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers. I just started my freshman year in college when I watched 9-11 happen. And here I was, I was going to school, playing football, and that was my identity. Tonight, the world's attention is absolutely fixed on Iraq. We only see a slice of the whole- I watched the wars unfold from the comfort of my couch and felt this guilt for being in college instead of being, you know, in uniform. So I made the decision then to, to join. I ended up keeping my commitment to the team and playing my, my last year. But as soon as I graduated, I was in a Marine recruiter's office within a few weeks. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, we were at peace. We weren't bothering anybody. I wanted to get revenge. I wanted to get even. 16 of us in my class all enlisted on the same day. I passed all the tests for the Navy. And they said, we'll call you in six weeks. I said, six weeks? Hell, I want to go in tomorrow. So next door was a Coast Guard recruiting station. I went in there and I said, if I enlist, when could you take me? They said, 10 days. I said, you got it. And I enlisted in the Coast Guard. I had relatives that served in World War II. That's my uncle Leon right there showing off his Navy dress blues. And we all had in us the idea that Americans respond when our nation is threatened. Way back in 1898, as the Spanish-American War was breaking out, a county clerk from Montana named Will Cave signed up. He even convinced 50 other guys to join him. One of them told a reporter, everyone knows what the Montana cowpuncher can do in a fight. It doesn't always take a national emergency to inspire people to answer the call. I know veterans who've signed up for all sorts of reasons. To boldly go where no one has gone before. I actually fell in love with Star Trek when I was in elementary school. I was super nerdy. I had a Starfleet uniform. I really wanted to be a Starship captain. Engage. But that obviously <laughs> was not possible. So in my head, the closest thing that you could get to Starfleet was the Air Force. The Air Force was all about technology and cool airplanes. And yeah, I just <laughs> fell in love with, with the whole thing. My motivations were pretty ordinary. I was broke and crashing at my brother's place. I had no job, no prospects, no place to go. So I figured, screw it. Why not sign up for the military? I did feel like I was a good match for the Coast Guard or the Air Force or the Army or the Navy, for that matter. 
so I joined the Marines. Raise your right hand and repeat after me, the oath of enlistment. I, 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 After our freshman year of college, my best friend Dale called me and he said, this summer, I'm gonna go to Marine boot camp. All I heard in that conversation was summer and camp. And I said, I'll go with you. Of course, he laughed and he said, you can't go. You don't know anything about the military. You've never run a mile. You're not even fit. Well, when I sat across from the recruiter, the general questions were super easy. Where are you from? Date of birth, mother's maiden name. Are you a homosexual? I'd never been asked that question by a stranger. I didn't want to have that conversation. So I said, no. And boom, I was in. My parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. They grew up in New York on the Lower East Side. And we only moved out to this little village because they wanted to live in the real America. Well, this village did not welcome immigrants. Everybody made me feel like I was a Semitic interloper. I got beaten up every day going to and from school. So as soon as I could, I enlisted and I escaped from a world I didn't like into one I did. I had two Marine parents. I just idolized them. My favorite shirt was, you know, my mom's a U.S. Marine. And I did, I wanted to follow in their footsteps. I mean, I came home from school, you know, every day in fifth grade and watched a Marine Corps boot camp video. And so when I signed up, they weren't surprised. In the Cheyenne culture, it's respected and honored and part of who we are and our makeup to serve. My father was in the U.S. Navy. He served in the Vietnam era. One of my uncles served in World War II in the Navy. Another one served in the Korean War. Another one in Vietnam. When I was a young boy, I would listen to their stories and just wonder like, wow, the places they've seen, the things they've done. They were like superheroes to me. My senior summer, one of my best friends came over to my mom's house. We were gonna go cruise around town or whatever. And I said, you know what? I said, I think I'm gonna go join the military today. And he started laughing at me. He says, you won't do it. So I went in there and uh, I was only 17 at the time. They, 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 they hooked me. I was, I was like, I'm going to the Navy. This is great. And uh, the rest is history. I really had convinced myself that people like me don't go to college. People like me work in fast food places, clean people's houses, you know, that kind of thing. So one day, I mail this letter at the post office, and out comes this tall, very, um, very sharp, very impressive Marine recruiter who basically looks at me and says, why aren't you in the United States Marine Corps? Well, I met him on the 30th of April, and by the 7th of May, I was a new recruit at Paris Island. I was really, really proud. You know, I was joining an organization that went back to 1775, and all the traditions, all the lore, all those would be mine if I could earn that title of Marine. <clears throat> Very excellent, again. So we see, uh, Amanda, um, that these veterans come from all corners of our country, all walks of life, uh, ethnicity, faith, and and uh, and lifestyle. What what did you notice as you were doing these interviews? What that uh, you, you didn't expect as you walked into this? Um. Well, first of all, I was amazed by how open people were with us. Um, I mean, it's not easy to sit down in a chair and and tell you know, your, your life story and also a story that often has a lot of um, intensity and, and difficult things to talk about. And um, the interviews we did often lasted, you know, as long as four hours. Um, 
And so, you know, I was amazed and just so grateful for the trust that that the veterans put put in our team. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of our goals was really to to show what what the experience of military service has meant to so many people um, and to, to tell the whole story, because there have been, you know, so many films that look at combat or that look at the experience of war or that look at the experience of coming home. Um, but our goal here was really to look at the breadth of, of the experience from your motivations to serve um, all the way through the mission, whether that's combat or, um, or you know, all sorts of other types of service, um, you know, in wartime, in peacetime, um, and then the return, and then what it really has meant to be a, to be a veteran and sort of um, integrating into civilian society. So, I guess I was I was most surprised and impressed by just the incredible stories that we heard and uh, the ways in which people opened up to us and shared shared their experiences. Cody, uh, you you were at the other end of the camera and the microphone as you were being interviewed. And, and you hear Amanda describe that now, what, as you were being interviewed, what, what was going through your head on how open you should be, you know, how much storytelling um, and, you know, should you hold back? So oh, that, that's a great question. Uh, that little clip that I just saw right there about, uh, about why I joined the service and how I went in the Navy and uh, that was hooked. Uh, there's there's a lot of backstory to that so you you want to you want to tell more it's it it's hard to be in that seat exactly like she said i should probably saw all of us squirming just thinking you know <laughs> we have a million things to say uh you know my story is no different than than millions of others who have served some of us didn't have direction we just wanted to get out of our hometown or or serve because our family members served or and we had a deep sense of service for our, our country. You know, I had all of those things combined. It was uh, very surreal to be sitting there and talking to uh, folks about, uh, I guess, feelings and thoughts and memories that I had put back uh, in the back of my brain housing group and hadn't thought about for a long time. Uh, you know, that story right there just made me think of, uh, I didn't join, I didn't walk into the Navy recruiter the first time I you joined the service. I went into the Marine Corps recruiter's office. I was going to be a Marine, but the recruiter was kind of a jerk with me. So I walked out and went next door to the Navy. <laughs> so that's how I, 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 and I had family members in the Navy and I was just kind of feeling it out. And if I had a different experience in that Marine Corps recruiter's office, I, I'd tell you right now, I'd be in the Corps. But that's just kind of, those are, I, I held back in that, in that interview a little bit because I was like, do I really want to tell everybody this? <laughs> I don't know. Is I'm sure the others felt the same way. We we all have a, a million stories to tell, whether you're a veteran or not. And being in that seat and bringing up all those memories and um, just thinking about them, having a little bit of a, a moment to just process all that was was very surreal. And I'm I can't say it enough. I'm just very honored and humbled to be a part of this project. And I hope veterans that see it and non-veterans alike to see it. Uh, understand that we come from your, we come from our communities. We're just regular folks that grew up right to the left and right of you, and 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 did what you did, and and regular people like you, and we resonate like you, and went out and served this great country, and we came back home, and we're part of these communities now. And uh, I'm I'm just honored and thrilled to be a part of it all. But back to your original question, because I'll get off target and talk all day. That's all right. Uh, I I was just overwhelmed. I I didn't realize being an all these lights on me and uh, they're like, okay, it's your turn to tell your story. And I'm like, well, I hope, first off, I hope my story is good enough because to be honest with you all, um, I, I believe there's a million other service members that I, thousands that I know and that I've met throughout my 24 years of service that I think should have been sitting in that seat other than me. You know, some of them gave their, their lives. Some of them gave limbs. Some of them gave the ultimate for this country. And uh, for me to be cho chosen, was a was a big deal, so it was tough. It was a know, tough ordeal. I, yeah, like that was real. Um, I think um, it, it's important at the 
at a moment like right now to to tell all of our veterans out there that that uh, you know your service matters and it mattered and it matters and at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum we like to say we don't lean left and we don't lean right we just lean into it like veterans and uh, and so um, you know uh, the recent happenings overseas in Afghanistan or or the years that you put into the combat zone or your support. We were with someone this past week and she said, I served five, six years. Our name's Debbie. And, uh, but I didn't deploy to combat. So I don't consider myself a veteran. And we said, heck no, you are a veteran. Everything you did serving our country really matters. And so for all of you out there, um, one, don't question the value that you, you gave to our country. And number two, call a friend who is a veteran and make sure they're doing okay because these are kind of rocky times a little bit. Um, and also everyone should know uh, we are open and we are strong and we're connecting. That's what this show's about, but we're open upstairs in the museum right now and we're impacting lives and, and, uh, and we will continue to do that. Um, so Cody, uh, not everyone knows it or may not have picked up on it, but you served in the Navy. Yes, you, sir. De you departed the Navy and then you joined the army. Yes, sir. Um, so what was it that brought you back to service and what caused you to jump, you know, jump ship and <laughs> pick up a rucksack? <laughs> well, after serving six years in the Navy, I, I, I started out on a submarine, went to a sub tender and ended up on the aircraft carrier on the USS Nimitz. Uh, it was it was a great time. I enjoyed every minute of it. Got to see the entire world. I circumvented the planet on world cruises, got out. Uh, didn't really have a sense of purpose after I got out. I felt kind of, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't want to use the word lost, but I just didn't have any drive that I, that I felt that, uh, that, that direction that, that was pushing me on for the, those six years, being part of something bigger than yourself. And I'd always, uh, like I told you earlier in the, in the conversation, I, I thought about joining the Marine Corps and actually tried, didn't, didn't work out and joined the Navy. And then I, uh, I, was wanting to get back into the service. And while I was in the Navy, uh, there's one thing that resonates in the Navy. It's a great organization, but the Navy is built around equipment. And, and it indulge me for a minute. We, we focus on keeping an aircraft carrier or a submarine or jets in the air to bring the fight uh, to those around the world that, that, that wish to do us harm. And it's a great organization. But as a person, I felt like Sometimes as a young man, I didn't understand the whole scope of, of what was going on. I felt like sometimes uh, my chain of command cared more about uh, equipment than me. But I'd, I'd heard family members and known people and <clears throat> things about the Army and their leadership style. And I thought, well, now I have the opportunity. I've been in the Navy and enjoyed all of that. You got to see everything and raise heck all over that planet. I, I want to see what this leadership I hear all about it, uh, is, is for, you know, so... I stepped forward, uh, joined the army, and I wanted to be in the infantry. I had no other qualms about it. Since I was a little kid, I wanted to be, uh, you know, be a part of that world. And I just my route kind of went a little different, different way. Joined the army. Um, I was offered the opportunity. I was still a, a, an enlisted uh, soldier when I first joined up, and then I got the opportunity to go to OCS. Uh, to make an impact. And as I started learning from some good leaders and folks, I wanted to emulate them. I wanted to be them. I wanted to be the best leader I could be. And uh, by God, the, the army gave me that opportunity. Uh, OCS uh, was another formation of just like boot camp. It, it puts you in the grinder, spits you out and makes you a, a humble, better person. And I just wanted to be part of the great leadership that I'd seen. I was a part of, and I was proud and honored to be a part of that team once I got out of OCS. So just all those things combined uh, resonated with me and wanted me to join join the Army and, and be a part of that great organization as well. And I'm honored to be part of both of them. That's really great. <clears throat> what, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to shift to our next uh, film clip. It's about six minutes. It's from episode three. So let's go ahead and roll it. This, this clip is about uh, leaving service.
When I look at this photo, I'm, I'm proud of this person. She looked like she went through a lot. I'm still standing tall. I'm still looking sharp. The goal of every veteran service is the tour of duty. That is what we train for and are willing to die for. But our journey doesn't end when we come home, and the road back can be a long one. My name is Wes Studi, and I made that journey. At age 17, I enlisted in the National Guard. A few years later, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. For me, service was a way to test myself and confront the challenges of war. Today, I am an actor with a long Hollywood career. But when I got back in 1969, I couldn't imagine what path my life would take. Sometimes, leaving the military can mean asking lots of difficult questions about the country, about the wars we fight, about ourselves. Coming home has a way of changing your plans, of changing you. When you fly out of Baghdad, they stuff you in an airplane. You're sitting in the cargo nets with all your equipment and it's dark, you can't see anything. You fly out at night for obvious reasons because it's harder to shoot you down at night. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the scariest moment of my life because it's right at that moment where everything could go wrong and everything you did, everything you just went through is all for naught. Oh my God, what if they shoot us out of the sky? You don't believe that you chewed me on that bird. My mind kept thinking about certain people that didn't make it or, or got seriously hurt over there. So that's how I flew all the way to Guam. Then we went down for the landing. I was waiting to either have an accident or, you know, some kind of destruction not to let me get across this pond. I just want to be left alone. I was trying to make sense of the last 34 months, the last soldiers I saw in the hospital. What happened? to them how are they doing where are they uh, all those kinds of things and you know I, i'm surrounded by soldiers high-fiving each other and drinking and carrying on and you know power to them um i didn't want any part of that i uh, just wanted to be, be left alone i wanted to be quiet when that flight takes off all i could think about was that first beer i'm not gonna lie I mean, I'm just sitting there, I'm thinking about how cold and refreshing that first beer is going to taste. Part of you is thinking, when can I come back and finish this? But I was pretty actively trying to swallow that urge <laughs> and just focus on that beer that I was going to get. My tour was up in April 1969. One day, I was in the jungle, and the next, I was stepping onto a plane and I got. I was totally on my own. But it wasn't always this way. American troops used to come home as a unit, and it could take weeks to get back to the States. During the slow trip from France, World War I veteran Will Judy wrote in his diary that, we talk much of comradeship in the coming 
civilian life. Like mystics, we are conscious of an association that binds us into a passionate group, different to all others. Making the trip together gave those veterans time to process what they had experienced. After Vietnam, the military realized how important it was to go through this transition as a group. It's one of the reasons it's done this way today. You have all these hundreds of Marines getting off these buses and there's just this field full of family members. We're all in uniform. We all look exactly the same. They're all trying to pick out who their son is. And you're trying to look through the crowd to find you know, your family. And you start to hear people shouting names and you hear these reunions and you oh. just keep waiting for, for yours. My mom would see me because I'm tall. She'd pick me out and then she just starts running and just like slamming people aside, you know, like, like a linebacker coming through on a blitz. Yeah, it was important for me at least to um, be strong. She was already scared enough. If I, if I broke down, she would have realized that her fear was warranted. But if I played it cool, then maybe she would just let herself believe that the tour hadn't been that hard. Very nice. Um, so, so this clip does talk about transition ending service. Um, many say that that uh, that moment in your life, you feel like you've jumped out of the airplane without a parachute. And so, Cody, you you uh, did this twice. What did you find most remarkable about transitioning? And and uh, and then uh, we'll come back to a question in a second about you know how did you find purpose after that but let's talk about the transition and how long you think you transitioned or are still transitioning well when i when i first got out of the navy my transition was a little bit rougher i didn't really have a plan i, I knew i just wanted to get out i was a young enlisted guy and it's kind of weird uh, I, i've been in the enlisted world for 13 years before i went to ocs and became an officer a planner a, uh, a leader. And I was around folks who constantly talked about when I get back home, when I get out, when I do this. And I kept thinking the same thing. I was a young guy. I was like, I want to go hang out with my friends back home. I want to get that sense of who I was, I guess, before. So when I got out, I didn't have a plan. My transition was kind of rough. I jumped around to a couple of different jobs. I, I Like I told you earlier, I didn't have a purpose. I felt you said it best. Like I jumped out of a plane without an air, with, without a, without a shoe. It was, it was kind of like, I didn't have my, my feet set on the ground firmly. I was just ready to get out. That's all I really knew. And when I got out, I, I didn't have that, uh, the left and right limits of what I should be doing, where I should be going. I stumbled through a few jobs before I got into the career of law enforcement and they ended up joining back up into the army for that, the sense of purpose I talked about earlier. Uh, to be the best leader I could be and be a part of a unit like that. Well, and then as years go by and, and I, I've had totally different experiences through uh, the military molding me into a leader and a planner and all that go, that goes into it. When I transitioned the second time out of, out of the army, I, I felt a little bit more comfortable. And I was also, I also had uh, a mountain uh, of support. My second go around my first go around, I don't think my uh, my family, except for those that had served in my family, understood uh, what I was going through when I transitioned out. They were just glad I was home. And that's all they really knew. There was a disconnect of what they understood happened to me over those six years. When I joined the Army and I drug my family now along for this ride through combat, through all my experiences as an officer, that, that my transition out was a little bit better because I had a per I had a plan now. I knew what I was going to be doing. I had a sense of purpose. I have established a life. My my children knew exactly who I am, where I was, where I was coming from, the experience I've been through. My wife is is an angel for supporting me through the whole mess. She still does. She beats me up every day, uh, keeping me on track. And uh, I'd be a liar to sit here like any other veteran and tell you that I don't think about uh, the service or the military. Uh, Every, every day, every other thought, 
I miss it. I miss it. And I think when you transition out, uh, you it, it really hits home, especially when you retire, like like you and I have. When you retire out of it, it 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 makes you even miss it more than just oh, I chose to leave. I, I want to go back. I I run with my rucksack every week, <laughs> just to feel that to to understand a to be a part of it still because I I know who I am. That's who I am, and um, it's the transition is still ongoing. It's part of a process I think I'll never shake. I think that's a great point. The uh, you know <clears throat> transitioned with the ED really. Um, it's probably a misnomer in transitioning with an ING because we are still going to grow. We are still going to make impact on life. We are going to bring that leadership to our community. You know, we are going to uh, make a difference uh, with raising your own kids and, and the relationship with brothers and sisters and, and uh, spouses. Um, Amanda, what, what struck you as you started uh, uh, getting with each veteran this discussion of their transition or transitioning? and their thoughts of service to the country uh, and in the communities. I mean, Cody just spoke about it so eloquently. Um, and I and I feel like what he was saying is, is so much along the lines of what we heard from so many people. Um, and, and, you know, what struck me is that no matter what people's experience was, you know, you, you hear about, you know, there's, there's people who are in combat who, have been through tremendous things and and trauma, and that's obviously a, a, a huge struggle when they come back. But no matter what people's experiences were, um, coming home was a, was a real challenge. And you you look at it as um, you know, as Jake Wood says, he just wants to crack the beer. You want to see your friends, um, but then that that sense of loss and um, and and the lack of sense of purpose and structure and comradeship, um, all the things that you know we were seeing in people's stories from you know what was so powerful about um, the transition into the military and the way that it shaped them and and took these 17 year olds, 17, eight year old, 18 year olds and turned them into soldiers. And, and what a powerful experience that transformation was. Um, you then see it on the other side. How do you, how do you reconcile leaving that and going back into, into the sort of the civilian world? Um, and, you know, we ended up actually in the in the series splitting it up into sort of two episodes. We have one that's just coming home, um, which is that immediate transition. But then we devoted a whole episode to um, to the notion of sort of how do you then find yourself in 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 this new life as a civilian um, and. So often, you know, it, it is finding a, a sense of purpose in service of some sort, um, not, not no longer military service, but service to the country um, and to the community. And we just saw that again and again. Um, so it, it definitely is, is a huge challenge for people, but also um, an incredible opportunity to bring everything that they have learned and become through through their military service out into out into their lives beyond. Cody, I'm going to ask you um, this last question, and then we'll be wrapping up in a second. I'll come back to each of you again. But um, what are the keys to success to be uh, to transitioning? Talk about uh, your identity, self picture, connecting to others, purpose, getting things done, helping out folks. Because, uh, you know, you, you've continued your service, law enforcement, high school coach, you know, so you're a great example uh, of, uh, of uh, things that you've done. But just describe if, if, if you had 100 people that were going to transition uh, in the next three weeks, sitting in, in a transition seminar, what would you tell them? I'd, I'd start off by telling them they have a unique uh, attribute, the drive that that has forged them to who they are. They need to pick that mantle up and carry it on, carry forward with it. 
because that drive of service is what makes this country great. I had the opportunity to speak at a uh, at my graduation for my bachelor's degree, and I told the entire crowd that I said, uh, "I don't care what your service is. I don't care if you're, you're wearing a uniform with with ribbons on it or medals on it. Like I got, doesn't matter." What matters and what makes this country great and combines veteran and non-veteran alike is a service to this country. I don't care if you're a librarian. I don't care if you're just a youth football coach. Uh, whatever your attribute is, whatever your niche is, there's a way you can make us all better. And those 100 folks you're talking about in this room that I had to guide from that moment, I would steer them in that direction. I'd steer that ship in that direction and tell them, the things that have motivated you and moved you, that drive, that desire to serve is what's most important when you leave this uniform. Because when you step out in those communities, they need you. They need everything that the government and our families and our, 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 our supportive endeavors, this country's poured into us. We need it still. We need it to keep going. That's what makes this country great. It's not a uniform. It's not what service you served with. Well, sure, we all brag about each service and fight each other over it. But if you pick on one of us, we all gang up and fight back. And our communities like that. If you think about America in a whole, we're like a big dysfunctional family. But if we all, some, something happens and pressure us on the outside, we all get together and go deal with that, that, uh, that issue. And that desire and drive is what, what pushes us. It's service, 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 service. I can't say it enough. And those folks that get out when they transition out, sometimes they don't have that. They, 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 don't, they feel this lack of purpose, this lack of sense. So I would shovel that on them. I would, I'll tackle it on them and just tell them, you have to keep serving. You are an individual who's unique. You've been trained. You're, you're, you're full of desires and hopes and dreams that are still not fulfilled. Go out and serve this great country and make us better. And I think right now, resonating in this country that's what we need and that's why i'm involved in things in my community from coaching raton high school football uh and mid-school football to my son's team i want to be a part of everything i want to be a part of my community i want him to know hey cody i owns here and this is all the things i've done and so what i'm still here to do more and i think our veterans are all going to be on board with that i know they that they need a sense of purpose that's why we get lost in the shuffle i think that we we lose that sense of community and i, I would dive in and fight with them and swim with them all the way to show them that's what you need. Fantastic. Um, and, and so now Amanda, um, you've, you've heard Cody again, can you imagine being uh, on his football team at halftime? Uh, I'll bet, I'll bet they get, they get no some one, motivation. No they're, they're doing so well. Well. Yeah. So, so as we, as we end up here today, first of all, what an amazing show. Um, your your uh, GBH special, of course, but this show to be with you today uh, for our listeners and and uh, our members um, and our guests and our friends. You you two are are just amazing people. Uh, you totally motivate me, Amanda. Two things: what did you learn today? And number two, um, what's next? What story are you going to tell next? Um, well, actually, I, we're, I'm still in the middle of uh, finishing the podcast for American Veteran because the series is not only a television series, but it's also um, going to be a nine-part podcast, and there's also a 10-part digital short series about um, all the things that uh, – focusing on objects and, and items that uh, – veterans have been have been meaningful to people through their service and that they brought home with them. Um, so I am actually deep in deep in work on the podcast at the moment. Um, so I hope everyone can tune in for all of it. Yeah, uh, we will. And um, we will do everything we can to to help spread the word of, of your your great work. Um, you know, we've helped uh, the 20 year war Read the book. We helped the authors and, and uh, photo uh, journalists there. The Veteran Golfers Group, Veteran Golfers Association, links to Freedom for Wounded Warrior down the stretch ranch out in Spokane. So get involved, everybody, in, in these great uh, veteran service and, and veteran connecting uh, activities. If you're in a company, start a VRG. If if it started, a veteran resource group. If it's already started, 
then uh, join it and be connected. Good, healthy habits. Don't suffer in silence. Call someone uh, and reach out should you need any help. Well, that about wraps us up. Cody, is there any, any last? I promised you you'd get a last word in. So anything else you want to say to our audience? Thank you for being here. Sir, I'd just like to end on a, on a, on a good note and uh, thank all the veterans out there for their service. Uh, thank Amanda and her crew and all the professionals that went behind this. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to be a part of it. And I hope that uh, these stories reach out and touch people. And thank you all for giving us a platform once again to speak on. And uh, just keep America great. Love everybody. Thank you all so very much. All right, great. So go, go to uh, nationalvmm.org, our website, and learn even more about us. And with that, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody who joined us today. And, uh, and thank you, Cody, and thank you, Amanda, for uh, these inspiring stories and, and joining us today. And with that, I'll turn back over to, uh, to Bill Jinks and, and the entire support staff here at the NVMM. Thank you for another great show. And Bill, over to you. All right. Thanks, sir. And Cody and Amanda, thank you for joining us today, uh, this weekend. You, you both did a great job. And uh, thanks for what you've done. Uh, in service to our country, Cody and Amanda, in sharing these stories of service uh, for our country. And we can't wait for the rest of America to see uh, the documentary. It's, uh, you, you guys did such a wonderful job on that. Uh, but the American Veteran is also a digital series. It's on YouTube. And there's also an American Veteran podcast uh, that will launch in two weeks. And um, that is available wherever anybody gets their podcasts. You can learn more at pbs.org forward slash American Veteran. And then also, we've got to give a special thanks to one of our corporate sponsors, Lane Aviation. Uh, they've done such a, a wonderful, supportive job uh, sponsoring our 2021 Rally Points as our corporate member. And then General Farragher had mentioned it previously, but tomorrow is the anniversary of the Battle of, of the Black Sea. That's also commonly referred to as Black Hawk Down or Operation uh, Gothic Serpent, or the Battle of Mogadishu. So in 1993, two Black Hawk helicopters are shot down in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia. And in the ensuing battle uh, to secure the crash sites and the crews, uh, 19 uh, men from Task Force Ranger and 10th Mountain Division uh, are killed. That's a, the largest sustained ground combat since Vietnam up to that point. Uh, so again, 19 American servicemen killed, scores wounded. Uh, but yesterday, 60 previously awarded bronze stars for valor were upgraded and presented to, to men that fought in that battle. Uh, and they were upgraded to silver stars or distinguished flying crosses. So the silver stars are our nation's third highest valor award. Uh, and then two were, were uh, distinguished flying crosses. So please keep in mind those families of the fallen who paid the ultimate sacrifice and uh, for, for their fellow Rangers. And then uh, just as another reminder, despite our national designation, we're not, we are an unfunded uh, nonprofit. We don't receive any federal, state, or local funding. All uh, programming and operational support is from our corporate sponsors uh, our donations and those who become members. So if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, we, we've got information uh, there below about about doing so. So would encourage uh, everybody, if you've enjoyed the program like this and, and the other ones we've done, is become a, a member of the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. And then later this month on um, October 20th through 22nd is Pets or Vet Week. Uh, so we've got some ticketing promotions uh, special pricing. Uh, we've got programs daily from 11 a.m. to 3, and we'll have a bunch of service animals or um, uh, animals uh, that are available for adoption. And then part of that, we've also got five wounded warrior dogs um, that will be in the museum, and they're by the artist uh, James Mellick. He's, he's a woodworker, uh, and a carpenter, and he, he does beautiful, beautiful work. So these are full-scale um, statues, of uh, wooden statues of dogs that he's created. So if you're interested in that, uh, come, come here and meet the artists on Friday, October 22nd. And then also uh, join us for our Veterans Day ceremony. That'll be Thursday, uh, the November 11th at 11 a.m. 
uh, Franklin County Commissioner and Navy veteran Erica Crowley will join us uh, and join our keynote speaker, who is General uh, Retired Les Lyles. He retired as the Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force um, and then became a successful veteran advocate and businessman. And then lastly, thank you and remember to reach out to our veterans. Sometimes a phone call or a, a Facebook message or a shout out is all that it takes to to make a connection much stronger. And uh, everybody who did serve, your service did matter and it continues to matter uh, in how you give back to your communities and take care of one another, your families and your fellow veterans. So thanks everybody, have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Wars aren't fought by countries, they're fought by people. Now hear their stories in their own words honor their service in your own way at the only museum in america that gives a voice to all our veterans the national veterans memorial and museum it's more than a museum it's the new home of the brave <laughs>